All right, Lindsay. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the March 5th Stanford Advisory Board Land Use Infrastructure Basis Position and Safety Committee meeting. My name is Lindsay Summers, and I'm the Deputy Designated Federal Officer for the Hanford Club. I'd like to identify a few reminders before we get started. The first one is this meeting will be conducted in accordance with the requirements of FACA, and the second one is each member has a joint responsibility for assuring that the operating ground rules are observed and discussions are conducted in a respectful manner. I appreciate your attendance today and I look forward to the robust meeting. Rebecca? Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, so today we have uh, a briefing uh, on the traffic safety, which is something that this committee um, has worked on quite a bit over the last few years. And then um, we'll have a break and then later we will be doing committee business uh, and open forum. So um, then we can go around the room and um, discuss uh, things that the committee would like to, to do in the future or maybe possibly uh, uh, craft some advice based on this <coughs> uh, briefing that we get this morning. So we have Brian here today to give um, <clears throat> the briefing. So, Brian, do we do we want to do a quick round of introduction? Just help yeah. very brief sure. around the room. Yes. Yeah. Well, hey, my name is Rob Davis. I um, am the chairman of the Dang Race Committee. I um, am not really an official member of this committee, but um, I think it's my responsibility to go ahead and show up and be here and listen to what people have to say. I'm John Preston, uh, representing League of Women Voters. Uh, no, sorry. I'm um, President of Traffic Safety by all means. Larry Grant, uh, Community at Large. Brian Miller at Holiday. Dan Strong in Franklin Health District. Uh, Rebecca Holland, I represent Hamtack. Lindsay Summers, Department of Energy. Bridge Blue, I represent the Western Civil Council. Susan Coleman, public at large. I'm Brian Jones, the region is the Travis City Chair Program. Chris Nielsen, uh, Safety Programs Manager for HMIS. Let's go around with that. Uh, Tom Rogers, Washington State Department of Health. And I'm Ginger Benneke, HMIS Safety Programs and Traffic Safety and Health. Thank you, Judy Talbot, facilitation team. Mm -hmm. Josh Patma, facilitation team. And online, we have Patrick Conrad, Gabe Bonney, uh, Matt Hendrickson, Matthew Campbell, and Rose Ferry. So thank you for those online for joining us. All right, Brian, we're to you for the presentation. All right, without further ado. <clears throat> and just let me know when we're trying to do the next. Oh, okay. Please, thank okay, you. I will do just that. All right, well, I am uh, Brian Jensen. I work for Hanford Mission Integration Solutions, uh, HMIS for short. And uh, I'm also the uh, chair of the Hanford Sightline Traffic Safety Committee. Uh, we do quite a few things in the committee. Uh, the purpose today is uh, just to update the group on. Uh, what we do and uh, the Hanford Site Traffic Safety Program. Uh, it's really just information only uh, at this point. And really, our desired outcome is to um, change the set of culture uh, regarding driving and safety on the Hanford site. And we do that through implementing high priority traffic safety recommendations uh, to bolster that. Uh, <clears throat> so, HMIS acts as the administrative lead and it facilitates the Hanford Site Traffic Safety Committee. Um, our committee established, is established to serve as an advisory group. Uh, and we give <clears throat> a consensus direction about cancer site traffic and vehicle issues and concerns, and also to promote safe driving across the site. The uh, committee is comprised of representatives from the Department of Energy, uh, the prime handler contractors, as well as local entities, uh, including our law enforcement partners. Uh, we really take a simple approach, and we call it the three E's of traffic, which are education, engineering, and enforcement. Uh, we, find, uh, we focus heavily on the education piece. Uh, prior to COVID, we had uh, approximately 10,000 vehicles entering and exiting the site page. Uh, that has dwindled some over COVID, but we're starting to see that number uh, come back up to pre-COVID levels. Uh, 
One of the issues with playing this on the site are the climbing roads and the infrastructure. Some of that leads to aggressive driving and uh, frustration driven risk taking. Uh, we also have some issues with yielding uh, on common uh, locations on site, especially in the morning and the afternoon where the heavy traffic is, uh, is uh, entering and exiting the site. Um, we've also noticed that decline in high occupancy vehicle use uh, since COVID. Um, maybe there's reluctancy uh, to use uh, shared vehicles um, after COVID. Um, and also distracted driving. Uh, people are just doing everything else other than driving their own. Uh, so what we do uh, monthly are produce campaigns. Um, we try to align those with both state and national, na excuse me, national uh, traffic safety campaigns, such as distracted driving, seatbelt use, speeding, aggressive driving, and other campaigns. Um, we also can, uh, produce uh, multiple communications, uh, memos, bulletins, posters, and videos. Uh, we put an emphasis on new and existing signage as well as update our large reader boards uh, with uh, safety messaging to promote awareness when those message boards aren't being used for uh, shipments or traffic delays or impacts or something like that. Uh, we do have a website. Uh, we feature uh, a link to our communications as well as contacts, uh, gear and elk uh, information, strike and herd information, um, as well as uh, snow removal plan, uh, traffic impacts, weather, um, uh, that stuff as well. Uh, we have a traffic safety email and a 376 safe uh, number where we use our observant report process. Uh, we encourage uh, employees to use that as an open line of communication uh, to not only uh, share with us uh, aggressive or dangerous uh, vehicle behaviors, safety issues, parking lot concerns, um, and whatever uh, else can be reported. We do uh, surveys from time to time. We like to gauge uh, where improvements are needed and we like to get, helps us gain a pulse of uh, how employees are feeling on the site in regards to traffic safety. Uh, recently, uh, actually prior to COVID, we uh, got some aerial surveillance signs and we worked with uh, not only the Department of Transportation out on SR240, but also with our own roadway engineers on the Hanford site. Um, to uh, map out the uh, aerial speed course so we can utilize um, Washington State Patrol's plane uh, to do aerial enforcement. Um, with staffing, with COVID, and some other issues, that wasn't able to materialize until last year. Uh, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we also created some speed site, uh, some, sorry, some site, site speed zone maps. Uh, that we've been placing inside the vehicles, as well as passing out to other work positions uh, to uh, show them, to share that awareness of what the site speed limits are. Uh, so it's less surprises for people that are on the site. Uh, we also have uh, produced uh, several deer and elk strike deterrents. Uh, we did a pilot program years ago uh, in two of our highest strike locations on the site. Those uh, all on Route 4 South, which is the primary road to the site. And uh, <clears throat> we put uh, some white seed bags on some heat posts uh, that basically mimics the back of the mule deer. And it should say to other deer that, hey, you know, other deer are here and it reduces the crossings in those high strike areas. Other states have successfully done that and they've seen a huge reduction. Uh, we've seen about a 20% reduction uh, in those high, high strike areas. Um, so we're currently still evaluating that we're going to continue that. Um, in addition to that, we've uh, created uh, cardboard actors, wood silhouettes uh, that have reflected material on them. Those are placed throughout the site um, near the roadway, uh, just as that extra reminder um, as when you're driving at night, and that deer, you know, that outline of the horns and the outline um, helps to uh, you know, bring awareness that hey, deer are still crossing, they're up here. Um, in addition, we have two large tunnel cutouts that we put on trailers that we move around the site to help kind of uh, align with some of our high strike locations or where we get reports of herds uh, congregating uh, for medical awareness. Uh, we also worked with our uh, GIS team last year to uh, produce a web, uh, a, sorry, a, an interactive map. So we place all our strike locations on the map and uh, we have a query feature as well as some other features. Uh, so people can be uh, informed and employees can go to that map and look at where specific strike locations 
that happens not just on our site roads, but also on the state highways that form the uh, national site. Uh, next, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say next slide. That's all right. Why don't we put your paper on? Okay. <laughs> uh, so, this is just an image of uh, what the front page of our website looks like. Uh, it uh, has all the links below for our communications, our bulletins, our rating packs, closures, gear and health information, as well as our contact information. Uh, next slide. Here are some examples of some of the communications that we've done as well as some of the posters. Um, the top right corner, Merge Like a Zipper, is a large sign that's currently in production. Um, that is going to be placed at one of two problem merging locations on site to help promote better awareness. <clears throat> Although Merge Like a Zipper is not a law, it's a very good practice. It helps uh, flow traffic that emerges from two lanes to one rail really effectively. So that's just a way for us to give the uh, awareness and the reminder out in a six foot by 12 foot fashion at our merge location. Uh, we're also going to have some lighting that goes on that so that we can be during the dark hours as well. Uh, we have a dry safely poster that we've uh, produced and put out uh, in multiple work locations, bulletin boards, uh, just as that extra reminder for the resource of 376 safe. Next slide. And then, uh, Obviously, the top picture there is uh, one of the handless side roadways where our four legged friends like to cross with uh, sometimes no one. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, lower right, or oh, sorry, excuse me, lower left is one of two signs. One's at the intersection of State Route 240 and Route 10 and 225 in those Benton City, and the other one up near the Yakima area, uh, very large signs. Uh, just on each side of the uh, higher strike locations on the State Route 240 corner, as a reminder. Uh, we've added recently some uh, solar power flashing lights uh, to our existing gear signs, also at our higher strike locations on the site, um, just as that extra reminder. And then you can see in the lower right there's uh, the you know, set of bags that uh, um, I was referring to earlier. Uh, next slide. Uh, so on the enforcement side of things, uh, we uh, pri partner primarily with Benton County Sheriff's Office. They are contracted to handle the uh, enforcement uh, on the handling side. But we also work with the uh, State Patrol and Richland PD as well. Um, as far as the area surveillance is concerned, uh, we were able to uh, successfully uh, partner with State Patrol, utilize their aircraft uh, back in uh, May of 2023, and uh, we did a joint uh, uh, multi agency enforcement uh, detail, including State Route 240, Route 4 South, and Route 10 on the southern end of the site. It was highly successful, just another tool that we use to get the message out. When edge, um, we, we shoot for education, but for those few percentage that don't respond to education, sometimes they need the enforcement piece to back that up. So that was very, very bad. Uh, we're, we always continue to evaluate our enforcement opportunities um, with Hanford Patrol and other law enforcement agencies. Uh, we also evaluate the use of uh, tandem enforcement between law enforcement agencies, not just in the air, but you know, on the ground patrols as well. Uh, we've been able to partner with uh, a local uh, regional task force for traffic safety, Target Zero, and they've been able to utilize some, we've been able to utilize some funds uh, to help facilitate that multi agency emphasis. Uh, the traffic safety observations and reporting, um, that's not necessarily an enforcement uh, piece, but it's a, if we receive a report of a reckless driver, uh, traffic safety team works to learn the uh, identity of that driver, and then we contact uh, employees and management uh, to let them know and encourage that manager to have a safety discussion with that employee. Uh, sometimes it's just as simple as a different perspective and following distance, or merging, and sometimes the uh, violation is pretty egregious like passing multiple we'll vehicles on a double yellow line. But it's just another angle we can use to get that safety message across the site. Uh, and then we regularly engage with our stakeholders, the DOE are the contractors uh, monthly through our meetings and then sometimes through subcommittee meetings uh, when specific issues come up. Because um, we are consistently and constantly trying to address aggressive driving and speed uh, on site. Uh, these are some images. So, yes, uh, the orange trailer up on the top of the screen, uh, we have six of those. And we work with our uh, roadway engineers as well as uh, the Benton County Sheriff's Office uh, to uh, 
uh, we use the speed data that we get uh, and we place those trailers in locations where we're seeing an uh, increase in speed or we're getting an excess number of complaints. Uh, the one on the left is the one or two new signs that are going to be fixed mounted, solar powered, and we're going to place those one of the wide barricade and one of the rattlesnake barricade for southbound accident traffic. Um, through some data collected over the last year, we've noticed um, a, a good decrease in overall average speed. So I think these serve as a, as a pretty good calming device and a visual reminder of your speed as you're traveling through the barricade. They're both the congested areas, hamper control is working. Um, so that's an, another way we can help slow down traffic and keep that uh, pretty safe. Next slide. Um, on the engineering side of things, um, we consistently work with our uh, site traffic engineer uh, and our road crews. Uh, in back in 2019, 2020-ish, uh, there was an engineering study done. Uh, that there was recommendations there to uh, that, that road expansions were needed both on Route 4 South, Route 2 South, Route 11A, pretty much the main north, south, and east, west roads that are going to the site, as well as some widening of the barricade and uh, some site parking. Uh, that study is currently on hold. Um, it's an expensive project. <laughs> Uh, we work with our local and state municipalities. Uh, a recent example of that is the roundabout 224, or 225, 240, and Route 10. Um, that has significantly, the reduced speed, the force reduced speed through that intersection has made that crossing very much, uh, much more safe for people coming from that city and uh, crossing that intersection. So that has been, that's been a value. We said yeah, good positive feedback from that. Um, we've, uh, Enhanced uh, our oversight with uh, uh, vehicle uh, uh, requirements on site uh, regarding uh, the use of alternate roads, uh, high restrictions, uh, and those are going on really during so we avoid prop, uh, primary key times, uh, and then also uh, escort and pilot vehicle um, for safety and visibility, uh, just to help alleviate congestion and burden off the main roads uh, when those must transit through the site. Uh, we also track uh, uh, a variety of different vehicle safety metrics, uh, animal strikes, uh, vehicle accidents for personal and government vehicle. Uh, that's been helpful to work with our law enforcement partners uh, to share uh, uh, problems and reports made so they can uh, uh, increase their extra patrols in those areas as well and help with the enforcement side of things. Uh, the last uh, see, a couple of years ago now, uh, we did an on site obstruction assessment uh, on some of the lesser approved gravel roads uh, that are commonly traveled to remote locations. We were able to identify some commonly uh, struck hazards to either get them properly marked or get them removed if it was safe to do so. Um, and then lastly, we've approved a vehicle investigation process for government vehicle incidents. Uh, that's been helpful uh, to also. Uh, for our education campaigns, so when we track common trends, common themes, we can put an uh, emphasis on that part for education, share with the workforce, just to keep that focus on whether it's 360s or using a spotter or uh, just other issues that are causing these vehicle incidents. So that's been very helpful. Uh, looking ahead to, 200, to 2024. Uh, and beyond, uh, we're looking at doing some benchmarking opportunities. We'd like to uh, contact and visit some other DOE sites all across the complex. Um, look to see how their traffic safety efforts are going and uh, what we can utilize from what other sites are doing um, to make uh, changes and improve our traffic safety on the Hanford site. Uh, we're always evaluating enforcement opportunities. Um, we realize that uh, education can't solve all of it. So sometimes enforcement uh, has to come and follow that up. Uh, we're working currently on a new driver awareness video. Uh, we have a high uh, turnover uh, in the last few years. Uh, we'll say something like 60% of the Android workforce are newer employees. voice. We've been here less than a couple of years. So we're working on a driver awareness video that focuses on the commute to and from the site. Uh, as to variegate etiquette, some of the things that uh, call uh, problems that we see and just in general awareness video. I think that would help uh, change the culture of the newer employee and get away from that hampered 500 mentality to a safer driving mentality. Uh, we're also looking at some stencil traffic safety messaging in, in uh, parking lots. 
Um, we mentioned the zipper merge signage. Uh, we're going to start with one, and then hopefully by the end of the year, we will uh, have another one created to add our SAC area of concern for merge. And then, as always, we continue uh, employee communications, uh, both through our own communications and through the 376 city. And uh, that is it. So, at this point, we can open it up for questions and comments. Well, what we'll do is we just pause for a moment. We'll take agency perspectives. Okay. Um, Brian, any thoughts or how you would like to comment? Mm -hmm. My perspective is, is we don't have a lot to do with traffic oncology, but as you've covered, you, you guys partner with other state agencies like the State Patrol and other folks. Uh, thank you for what you do. I know we go, out, we go outside a lot, and traffic safety is important to us. I had just one clarifying question, and I know you talked about the, the L kits and that kind of information, and you talked about like the 20% reductions. So sorry if I missed this number, but, um, but how many uh, elk like in hits or deer hits were there in the last year? I'm just curious. Oh, just looked at the map too. I don't know specifically. How many were last year? It varies usually between 12 and and I think 22 has been the highest over the past five or six years. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And uh, the last question I had was. Um, I didn't see a link on here. What's you guys' is it, uh, website URL? Is it part of camper.gov or is it a whole separate website? Is it an employee only? Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's rl.gov. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's not an external website, it's internal. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. No, you got it. Oh, I think. Okay. All right. And I do not believe that we have CPA on the call. All right, so we will open it, and we have a question online. Uh, Ro. Go ahead and unmute. Well, good morning, everyone. I actually just typed my question in. I, um, I just wanted to know how many traffic citations are actually issued on the site. Um, every month slash year uh, for uh, traffic violations and also you know what is the level of patrol that is being done so there's that and then the other thing is i mean if 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 safety is really if if that's a really big issue um has um has doe considered maybe lowering the speed limit to ensure uh, better safety out there so just a couple of things i was just on this topic that I that came to mind. Um, I know I have been out there many times when people clearly are just like whizzing past me. And I mean, I'm going the speed limit or, or maybe even a little under sometimes. And so I'm just kind of curious ab about that. That's it. Okay. Um, so I'll start with uh, the Benton County Sheriff's Office is, uh, we have two dedicated deputies that patrol the site. Um, they do that um, seven days a week um, for 12 hours a day. Um, they can't be everywhere. Um, they typically focus on the, the higher problem areas, but uh, we do report uh, the issues that are happening in other places, and they're very good at responding and providing patrols there as well. Um, number of citations, um, they, uh, yeah, we see a, a lull with COVID and uh, reduction of traffic, and then they've had uh, staffing and personnel issues. But since we've had a dedicated deputy in 2023, uh, the citations have gone uh, significantly up. I want to say they probably uh, average 35 to 40 per month. Yeah, and there was, I think, 300. Yeah, over 300 this yeah, almost year. 400 issues last year uh, on site. Yeah, so that was a, a big improvement from the last couple of years. Uh, in, uh, and I think it's helped that they've got the staffing numbers back up. And we had some dedicated in the site that hasn't just been deputies sprinkling through the site. Um, as far as lowering speed limits, I know that always gets uh, talked about from time to time. Um, I don't believe there's any current discussions on that. Um, I know that's something certainly to be looked at, uh, but we also have to look at if the speed limit is too low and people are still willing to speed, does that cause additional safety issues? Uh, but that's certainly something that our traffic engineers um, look at from time to time. I think, did I, yeah. did I get all your questions? I think so. Okay. Dan? So I'm one of those guys who drive 60 miles an hour under a 240 in a big old RV. I'm the guy you hate to be behind. <laughs> Why? Are there not passing limits on all these roads here and there? 
can't you work with the state of Washington and make a place for slow folks like me to get out of the way of people who want to go nine miles an hour over the speed limit, which is 74 on, in, in that stretch. And if you go out there, you'll find an awful lot of people drive 74 miles an hour. When I'm in my passenger car, I do. So, I, you know, go arrest me. But uh, still, why don't we have passing limits? How hard is that? And how expensive would it be? It's not like there's no room. Yeah, it's there's definitely room to expand out there. I mean, but uh, unfortunately, I think it comes down to money. I mean, the state has to prioritize statewide where money is spent for roadway improvements. Uh, I can't. It's so, speak for the state of Washington. Actually, that's DOE funding. Yeah. yeah. I mean, would, can't DOE give? Are you talking about money to for fix the roads? You're talking about like uh, for south. Well, uh, either on-site or too boring, which is a lot of you were driving I Well, I am, but I'm driving on 240, but this is a problem everywhere. There are slow folks and fast people, and passing lanes make it safe, unless you have, you know, three lanes, and that's the recipe for death, my opinion. But, uh, you know, there are passing zones on roads all over the place, and, and that would you know, that would solve a lot of crazy people who get behind me and, you know, and then they, they can barely pass and they cut in and throw me and I got to slam on my brakes so we don't all get killed. I mean, th this is a attack fix. It. Not that So uh, I have a question following up on that and, you know, put this all into the mix. Following up on the metrics question, like what is the level of accidents out on the site, you know, Fender vendors, serious accidents, fatalities, like what are those levels? How does it compare with general public statistics? So actually the level of fatalities on site are non-existent compared to the rest of the public roads. Um, there's only been two uh, recently, one was in 2019, one was in 2020, um, for fatality accidents. Uh, serious accidents, uh, most of this stuff are fender vendors. Um, a lot of it's just in, in regards to the congestion of the barricade in the morning or somebody, you know, not paying attention and merging. But we have very few collisions. Actually, I would say the lion's share of collisions are related to deer elk strikes on the site. Um, as for 240, that's a little bit differently because that's a public access road. Um, there's been a few more fatalities over there over the last 10 years um, and serious accidents. Um, but as far as site roads, um, the, the, the level of collisions are actually pretty low compared to other places. And then um, we have Richard here. Yeah. Um, just, just, I'm, I'm on the board of environmental transit as well. And so for 10 years, or since 2010, I've been trying to get bus service out there. And I will still continue. Um, even though the Department of Transportation doesn't allow us to run out buses out on their site, which is amazing to me. Uh, because the federal money can't take them up to a private entity, which is quite big. I will be discussing that with our congressional daughter. This is the next one. Um, uh, but I've, I've been part of the Tampa 500 for. 40 years off and on. Um, uh, on site obstructions, are you evaluating your parking lots? Yes. Okay. Because you know, there's some of them that are really bad. And then your new driver awareness video, are you emphasizing ride share and land pool? Uh, we are pouring more money into vans. We're, we deplete our vans we, over the uh, COVID times because you shut down all vans right. and, and our vans started rotting in Main Street for uh, catalytic converters. But, um, but we, we are purchasing more with, with our money, but it would be you know, improving, especially since the traffic on 240 within Richland is just a, a problem. Um, the uh, you know, putting that out there and talking it about, especially with new employees who don't know how much there is. Um, 
And uh, finally, the former entity of this subcommittee had developed advice relative to the intersection with State Route 10, uh, with, with 10 and 240. Uh, and I still think it's valid advice of putting a exit from 240 onto 10 up upstream of the roundabout just to get that traffic off and keep it moving. I think the recent uh, you know, slowdowns coming up to that that roundabout would uh, uh, the old the old route still exists if you look at the aerial so where it came off of uh, 240 onto 10. Okay. It, it's probably half a mile up up the road. Uh, you know, having a a slip lane that would get you bypass that onto 10 would probably reduce some of the frustration on the morning commute. Because I've I've done that commute out of Clean Bridges to 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 West show too many times. <laughs> they do have slip lane. Right. right after that, are, are you referring to way further back? Further back to put a slip lane. That would reduce some of the pressure on that in the morning traffic. And then we also did advice on the, uh, the, the fire station at 300 area. And I think the response was, well, we're going to close the fire station. Now we're not going to close the fire station. So is there plans to do something for the station? <laughs> I can't really say I don't know. Yeah. I can look at it. Well, different right. people. Okay. okay. All right, well, um, I'm still looking at uh, uh, at finding funding to provide the bus out there, whether it's through uh, uh, under, under underserved populations, uh, providing bus service from Pasco out there and increase the access to jobs from underprivileged areas. Uh, I can speak to that a little bit. I know um, the HMIS leadership has worked over the past year with Ben Franklin. Right. Well, so I know they're looking at every option that is open to them. DOE, um, of course, ultimately it comes down to the Department of Energy um, making that decision uh, and <coughs> being associated with funding or uh, along those lines. But it sounds like. Um, Things are back in the hands of Ben Franklin Transit and try to maneuver around different obstacles in order, like you're talking about, um, and getting the transit, the public transit uh, system on site. Um, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to find out yeah. alternate funding sources for that. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, yeah, you're. Well, I'm sure you're well aware that it's thoroughly being looked at. Yeah. Rebecca, were you going to add in and then? Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple of comments. Uh, Richard mentioned, and I was hoping that we would have that. I thought I requested that we have a copy of that advice that um, we can make it up. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> uh, this is the. So the number on it, yeah. What is the date on that? September 19, 2019. Okay, 2019. Okay. So this committee used to be named oh, Advice 301. It used to be uh, under a different name. We've changed the name of this committee. Uh, we we issued a couple of pieces of advice back in yeah 2019, uh, and we also we worked with the. Uh, the traffic safety committee uh, at that time while we were uh, developing this advice. Um, one of the issues, like uh, Richard had brought up, that 
that stub road that comes off of 240. Um, you can actually see, like you said, the aerial footage. Um, we, we looked at all of that. That's part of this advice in here. Um, yeah, it's back um, before the roundabout right there. It's actually on Department of Energy land right there that would have alleviated a lot of those issues right there because, of course, on 240. Or Route 10, I guess it is. Um, uh, we were basically, you know, told, well, we don't have the funding to do that. Uh, we also worked a lot with the Department of Transportation, you know, and then that roundabout got put in. Um, I'm wondering also about this engineering study, because I remember that. That was back, that was quite a few years ago when they did that. 2020. Huh? 2020. Okay, 2020. Okay, so four years ago. Um, so when you say it's too old and the funding is not available at this time, um, first of all, where is the funding coming from? Is that Department of Energy or um, is Department of Transportation have a, a hand in that as well? Or uh, Department of Transportation knows, as far as I, as far as I understand, uh, it has to be congressional approved. To get these money from infrastructure uh, improvements or additions on the property. Uh, that's right. right. So the recommendation was made from the study um, in 2020 and actually um, got moved along pretty far. We had uh, approved it and it gone to, con to congressional approval, and that's where it stopped. Um, Okay, and uh, 2032, I think, is the next yeah, date uh, for movement. Movement, what do you mean by movement? For funds being available or allotted. So 2032. Yes. So part of the reason also that we were told that some of these recommendations that we had made uh, was because supposedly the the traffic on these hampered roadways was going to lessen over time. And we did see some of that with COVID, of course. You know, we've got a lot of people working remotely. Um, we don't have as many vehicles, but we do have more single occupancy vehicles, as you had mentioned. Um, and I think with the VIT plant going to be up and running, it's going to be a 24 hour operation out there on the Central Plateau and the vitrification plant. Um, I'm wondering if um, if there are plans now to to relook at that and the traffic that's actually on those roadways um, at this time, single occupancy vehicles, and what the projection is for the number of employees that are going to be out there on that central plateau. Um, because you know, as well as I do, that roadway from the white barricade out, you know, it's two lane road, yeah. and um, you know, I don't know what the, you know, the budget, there's no funding. I don't know what the cost of safety is to Congress or to the Department of Energy, but we got to get our people to work safely and get them home safely. And, you know, that roadway, I've been on the site almost 38 years, and that roadway's never changed since I've been there. It's the same road, and, you know, it's aging, and um, you have one accident, and it holds up the whole, the whole site going to work right. so is there are there plans then to to look at that maybe put some people out there like they used to or put those strips across the road to count the traffic or they the, they moved to a wireless technology so you won't see the strips across the road anymore they just have a box that counts and it's usually down to a speed limit sign or a, an existing sign to the road that's continuously being on all the site roads that's an issue of concern ATP going on the line, uh, there's going to be more traffic you know, to and from the site. Uh, the roads are, are breaking down. Route 4 South is the best of all of them. But, uh, I don't know if you, last time we driven on Route 2 and the River Road, and the uh, shoulders are crumbling. And yes. it's, it's starting to get in bad shape, especially after the winter when the potholes come in. Uh, it's bad. Uh, so I, I can't answer 100%. You know, that's really in our traffic engineers um, wheelhouse as far as pushing that, pursuing that. Um, but we certainly make that recommendation regularly that we're going to have to either improve the roads or figure out a way to reduce the vehicle footprint. Um, 
on the site to and from. Okay. What, what's the process and decision making to actually see those or the timelines? So if employees are saying, you know, what could be done or when, what's that process? Who makes the decisions? What's the timeline? Uh, you mean for uh, roadway improvements? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That right. ultimately is going to be DOE. I, if I may sense to say something too, um, I know over the past years um, there has been, you know, road rate improvements. There's been um, pullouts uh, incorporated, um, um, the additional working with the WSDOT, like we talked about in the roundabout. Um, our road maintenance crews are out there every day um, maintaining the roadways and trying to do the best that they can with them with limited funding. Um, and so there are efforts going on every every day. That, yes, the roads are old and deteriorating, and if this comes to the um, situation of, of the large amount of funding that's needed for um, a full rebound on some of those roads, and you know that's kind of where we're sitting. It's, it's been a constant push. So I have one last I have one last comment. Okay, and then Richard, you wanted to add into go ahead. I have one last comment. Sure. So when we talked about the 300 area, um, yeah, you said that's a separate briefing. The actual, the what we had talked about in this advice back then was the lights and that turn off coming off of the highway where you turn into the 300 area. Mm -hmm. uh, that was supposed to have been approved um, back, you know, four or five years ago, and it's become a problem again where when you're turning off of there, cars going at a high rate of speed, turning into the 300 area, um, it's it's causing a lot of issues right there. So I don't know if there's any plans to, to look at that. I heard that there was possibly gonna be some work, some newer lights put in and stuff, but um, that's another spot that really needs to be looked at. Yeah, <clears throat> I know uh, the, our traffic engineer told me once that the requirements for overhead lighting have changed and become more expansive. So, i.e., they become more expensive uh, to do. Um, the 300 area may not be an issue, but if you just pop on in that area, with some of the more remote intersections, uh, solar requirements are much more expansive than what's currently there. So, it's uh, a bit more to bring them up to code and bring them up to speed. Uh, the 300 area can be looked at. Uh, I'll have to I'll check in. We'll have to find out what's going on with that. Okay. Richard and then Rob? Um, I just want to uh, come back to talk about Project uh, 10. Um, the current transportation improvement plan for West Richland, uh, represented in West Richland, um, with the growth that we're seeing, we're putting 3,000 3, houses out on the, out on the ranch. And so we will be connecting King into Twin Bridges. So and then we're improving uh, the 240. We're currently working with the state to having 224 with four laying it all the way out to two. So traffic patterns will be, and that, that's ongoing now, um, and it's fun. So traffic patterns out of Twin Bridges to 240 will become a shortcut for a hell of a lot of people. And that's why I bring up that slip lane. Yeah, because that will become a much quicker route for people than the old uh, students. Sure. So that's that's why I bring it up. Okay. It's important because it's not going to happen tomorrow, but within five, ten years, you're going to have that, and that's how long it takes you to get information. So that slipway improvement on Route 10 is important. Okay. Appreciate that. Well, and then, um, yeah, I, um, a little bit about your structure. You are the safety folks. Is there a counterpart to engineering folks? Yeah, okay. Yes. Now, the question that I have is that looking at our system plan, you need a roads that are going to last another 50 years. Okay. And um, I, I'd like to know a little bit about the ceiling, the maintenance of the roadways, and maybe that's not. Um, uh, but uh, striping, uh, chip ceiling, um, all these activities are, are 
you know, you see the state of Washington, they do them every year, going over the passes and etc. So, so what is this other engineering organization doing to advance this, to allow us to go the next 50 years? Um, also, lighting. When you have the WTP going to 24-hour operation, a lot more lights are needed on the roads, especially with the turning and slowing and yielding and things of that sort. So is engineering on this? I mean, do they have goals set for when these are going to happen? Or um, are we uh, just doing it when we have a problem and go fix it? You know, another problem, we go fix it. Another problem, we go fix it, rather than a coordinated approach towards the next 50 years of road use and maintenance. Well, the 50 year outlook is more of the study that is going to hold because of funding. Unfortunately, with the budgets that the road maintenance have, they are more reactionary with fixing uh, chip seal and crack seal and um, improving shoulders, uh, yearly restriping uh, efforts, fixing potholes. Um, so, but I can't speak 100% for them, uh, but I know that's what they've been doing of late. Um, the long term plan. Uh, included intersection improvements to include lighting at, uh, up on the central plateau, the widening of the barricade to include lighting. Uh, that's all in that uh, large price point that's on hold due to funding. So, does anyone recall which funding is the, uh, you know, we get the funding levels for the 09, the different levels of DOE and the WTP, et cetera. How much is committed to the infrastructure? Do we know? Do we, need to offer advice? Do we need to offer advice? Well, we have your cleanup priorities advice. Um, I just took a look at that. Traffic safety wasn't included in there. I don't know if this is something that you want to include in next year's budget priorities advice, that infrastructure piece and roadways. I, I, I think it's going to be up to, to Becky to, to decide on that. But I, I certainly think that if we're neglecting it, it's easy to neglect roads. It's easy. You know, yeah, we've got more important things to do. But 50 years, <laughs> you know, it's a major, major, and, and what do we have, what, 15,000 employees who are driving out or getting out there a, a day? Um, and that keeps up over and over. Now, the fact that that Richard mentioned the Hanford 500, um, that was funny, because <laughs> it was a race. Um, from the end reactor and 222S lab, the back road through White Bluffs. They'll be generally traveled on it. So, a little Corvette with red interior and a black charger would uh, every Friday they'd have their race on that. And uh, everybody knew that in the labs. And uh, I think money was even put down a couple times. <laughs> just, to, just the way it was. All right. Um, thank you guys for a good presentation. I had some questions and you answered them pretty much within this. Um, I had a, a, a minor question. Do you maintain a, uh, a site count for the, the web map and the website so that you can determine if it's being used or how much it's being used? Uh, yeah, we can check our IT. I mean, is this something that it's not something you do ongoing. You don't look at monthly. We used to do that more frequently. Um, uh, I'm just wondering the, if communication if, side and, and tracking of our metrics and so forth, and um, and that our staffing is limited on the communication side, and so I'm kind of doing all all of the above, and so no. my resources have been yeah, kind of limited. Well. Um, but that's something that we've definitely been thinking of. Um, Stepping up I, that would be that would be not a difficult thing to, no. to do some little changes that might pull more people to that and, and in turn that could protect some of the elk and that sort of Rebecca I think we should have um, traffic engineering in here I I think we should talk about um, the study that was done years ago the, the needs that that have been identified here and and why some budget money hasn't been forthcoming yeah that's certainly something that this committee can talk about when we do our after this i yeah, think we'll definitely talk about that okay thank you i'm done and cheryl okay this is a easy question i think uh 
Um, I'd like to know if somebody has a breakdown out on the site, uh, how long does it take to get a tow truck out to them? <laughs> um, it's probably, I know a variable, but I don't, is, is it you know, minutes, hours, or what? It takes a while. Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a couple that are in West Richland, uh, but they're not always available. Uh, so most of them come from Richland and Kennewick. It could be north of 60 minutes before they get out. Okay, yeah. over an hour. Over, over an hour. hour. Yeah, and then there's, um, they usually try, most tow companies know to call the Hanford POC, and then the Hanford Patrol will ask them to the location of the broken down in the vehicle. They can complete the tow and then they'll escort it off site, which alleviates the matching issues. Yeah, it's great. So, if 30 minutes if you're lucky, then most of the expect 60. Okay, thank you. You are. Rebecca, did you have questions about lighting get answered? Do you have other comments you want to put in? Uh, I, I, I think you said that they're looking into that and, yeah. or that they will um, bring that up. So uh, I'm good with that. And I'm just curious, on that committee that you're working with, do you have employees on that? Are yes. employees part of that? Yeah. <coughs> each, uh, each, con each contractor has a uh, bargaining unit and an exempt representative on the committee. Um, and then there's some entities like Energy Northwest, um, WT, WT, that have, you know, a one individual representative or like WSP or BCSO. Yeah. So. We're going to go to Ian and I just want to encourage people online that if you have any questions, put them in the chat, raise your hand. Yeah. You mentioned for um, like looking into the future that you were going to um, look at other DOE sites and see kind of what, what they're doing with transportation and infrastructure and roads. Mm -hmm. um, do you know which sites you're going to be looking into? Is that next year or is that a few years out? And well, it's going to be a combination there. I don't think we'll be able to get to everyone, you know, in 2024, uh, but we're looking at uh, Savannah River, uh, also Idaho, the Nevada test site, um, potentially um, Los Alamos, uh, but uh, we want to start with Savannah River because they do have a unique um, traffic enforcement with their uh, security and their their version of Hanford Patrol, uh, so we want to start there, uh, but certainly, you know, time funding and that kind of stuff. We'll start there and work our way you know, to some of the other sites to see what's effective. And we're a unique dynamic to where we're remote, um, whereas other uh, sites are that highways and cities run in the And is Savannah River, in, this, in terms of this, like a model that you might want to follow? Like they're doing things well? Yeah, potentially, yeah. Okay. They got the point system, right? For the drivers. I think some, something like that, yeah, where they uh, driving on their complex is a privilege, you know, not a right. You can be um, suspended or removed oh. for you know, documenting for driving. Okay. Can I, can I tag, I'm going to tag Team Off Mia's question. Okay. Is there a complex wide traffic safety committee? that you guys participate in and can compare notes with the other sites. I mean, I know a lot, EM does a lot of complex wide. Yeah, there's not. Not that I yeah. We have contacts, but no committee. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of would probably make sense to have, because that way there's your bench party and opportunities right there without next best thing to travel. Sure. Richard? Okay. I'm thinking back also, while you're out, look for solutions to public transit. Of course, yeah. Absolutely. Well, Idaho has buses. Hmm? Idaho yeah. has buses. Yeah, but the DOE buses. <laughs> right. Like we used yeah. to have. Well, we did once in a while. Well, I know. <laughs> <we're not. laughs> no. We haven't even went on. Really? Well, this is the yellow bus. Yeah. I'm sensing that, that there's a little bit of confusion on whether we're talking about uh, traffic safety on site or the holistic approach of getting there. And so just on site roads, yeah, DOE has got a lot more control over that than they do of Highway 240. But, um, you know, I was thinking of, of DOE sites that are out in the middle of nowhere. How about Pantex? Well, Pantex has got a divided four lane highway that goes to within one mile of the site, US 60. And they don't 
they're not going to have a lot of the problems that we have with our two-lane roads. And so uh, when you talk about bus service, that's not just on-site. That's off-site as well. So I, th I think traffic safety at Hanford includes on-site and off-site traffic safety. And, and certainly uh, 240, we've even talked about that slip lane at the roundabout and, and, and so on. So uh, I, I would like to find out if anybody else thinks that we need to look at traffic safety holistically, both on-site and off-site. And you know, DOE should have some leverage over the Washington State Department of Transportation or, or perhaps getting some stimulus money, uh, infrastructure money, I mean, uh, to, to help with this problem. But so, you know, there's a huge one coming from Amarillo to, to Pantex, but I don't think that's anywhere near as bad as the huge, similar commutes to remote parts of Hanford and Richmond. Except that the road is a lot better. And, and I, I'll offer some background on the non existent site. The rules at Rocky Flats were if you had a ticket on site, you weren't allowed to drive on site anymore, so people would go to the gate and hitch a ride in. And that was a, a very good turn. Yeah. <laughs> the the yeah. one thing that um, I don't think Brian mentioned is they did, uh, it's been a few years now, got the uh, telemetry devices added into all the government vehicles out there. So they do have uh, at least HMS, I'm not sure what the other contractors' policies are, but they do kind of have a graded disciplinary approach to certain it's all based off speeding um, but there's um, certain things that kick in and like when you're 10 over versus hey, 15 yeah. over 25 over it goes yeah. from a day off without pay all the way up to termination so um, in a government vehicle. in a government vehicle so the other part is how do you take care of the POVs so and, and the and the the POV contractors are all currently under discussion for additional enforcement options when it comes to driving your private vehicle on site and you, you know with that there's all kinds of um oh. Oh. And positives and negatives to that and so they're taking a look at really what options are available well i, I can give you an example of a doe site where nobody speaks and that's sandia national laboratories in albuquerque because they're on kirkland air force base and a speeding ticket can be issued at one mile an hour over the speed limit and you are in federal court. If you don't show up in federal court, you know, that's a big world hurt. So when I used to commute and go down to Sandia, the DOE people would say, don't speed, don't even go one mile an hour over because they love just pulling you over. And then, so I fly back to Richmond and suddenly I've got a speeding ticket date in Albuquerque. And uh, so that Sandia, you don't have people speeding there because it's on, uh, the Air Force Base. Okay. And so does DOE not have the ability to have federal law enforcement on the DOE side? I would think they have the ability. I don't know why they don't. Does but the Air Force write the tickets? Like is it the military? Yeah, 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 yeah. I got the Air Force well, focus part. And they have been ongoing talk about deputizing certain patrol members, uh, but it's uh, they used to be. Yeah. So I'll give you a background on that. Years ago. Uh, it was a lot easier to work with the local sheriff's department. The sheriff's department could get training and deputize anybody you want, as long as the certification and the training backed it up. The state of Washington has now removed reserve commissions and it requires anybody getting that commission to go through the full basic law enforcement academy. The outside of that is there's not one in past. The downside is it's five months and it's expensive. and you know, they are going through the you know, Amber Patrol Academy. So if they're coming to the Blackfins to send, you know, a patrol officers to another academy, you pay that bill, and then there's a the risk of that employee then moving and going to a law enforcement agency. But, you know, so anyway, that has been looked at, and that's a major hurdle that didn't exist back in the 90s with the Amber Patrol as a trafficking commission versus now. I just want to follow up the, the way of enforcing a rocky class was your badge was required to be scanned to get on the side of your car. So you couldn't, if you got your zip, you couldn't open the gate to get on the side of the oh, oh, oh. 
So, I mean, that was where the enforcement comes in. So, there's more to it than just simply, oh, we're going to deal with the mechanism to enforce it as well. Well, what's the connection between your traffic safety and Energy Northwest? Oh, uh, they are an invited member of our committee. Uh, <coughs> welcome to participate with yeah. their own issues. <coughs> they have in the past. Uh, recently, their participation has been scattered and limited. They can receive all of our communications uh, uh, and meeting notes, minutes. Um, we do have open lines of communication with them. Um, attendance from them has been low, but it doesn't mean that they're not staying on top of everything going on. And when we do have an issue or a concern, um, they're very open to uh, open line communication. Uh, with them. Right. Yeah. Well, there's some unique situations with those two roads that lead up to their plant, and, right. uh, and there's a lot of speeding on that as well, and, and et cetera. So, yeah, Brian, uh, they actually just recently requested um, some additional enforcement on the road into Energy Northwest. Brian, a little more detail on that, but um, so yes, they, they'll actually give us a call, and just because we have a good um, open line of communication with Benton County and right. Uh, right. traffic. Sorry, so. are, are they participating in uh, road repairs, budgets, and things of that sort? Yeah, that would be a thousand people working there. You know, I mean, it's, it's a large. And I know that changes in the spring, the June. Oh, yeah, the yeah, outages. Yeah, outages, yeah, of course, yes. So they'll typically do some coordination uh, with us and, uh, and the are contractors uh, when the traffic bumps up. Thank you. I just have one last comment. Uh, if it, anybody else, anybody else have in the queue? No, no. Okay. Uh, one uh, other item to think about in 2025. What we're thinking a little bit. George Washington Way and Jadwin are going to go down to one way. How that is all going to play out, I don't know. But that is also going to play a major, major role in workers getting on and off the site. Um, so that's something else I think that maybe we could dive a little bit into this committee, maybe, you know, see how that's all going to work out. This happened next year, 2025. Yeah. Do you have any insight into that? There's going to be three lanes each direction. Uh, include bike lanes, uh, sorry, the new state uh, safe street uh, program that Washington State is usually utilizing. Uh, so it'll be good for bicycle traffic. Uh, it's going to need a lot of advanced education because we're not used to one way streets uh, in the Tri Cities. It's not the vision. That's for So uh, it's going to be very interesting. To see how that works. Uh, I know for you know, us that work in a federal building, you know, Jadna is going to be a completely different environment. Um, Southbound in the afternoon, because all that traffic on George Washington Way has now been flowing down Jadna at 4 30 in the afternoon. So that's going to be different for sure. Uh, but as far as I know, it's going to be at the intersection of Jadna and uh, George Washington Way, is where it's going to split off. And I believe it's going to go up to Simon Street. That's going to cut off okay. right before uh, what is that school, the elementary school there. Yeah, Jefferson. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 2025. That's what I have to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just go ahead. Good question. If it's okay, I, I was just thinking about it. In 2019, I was driving to Sela in like December over the highway, and I was getting bombarded by tumbleweeds, and then that was the same night where there was like the tumble getting where it was like 20 foot high walls. I was just curious on the Hanford side. Have you guys seen that before? Oh, it probably has happened a lot. Did you have the earth blocked by some of these quite a bit? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <just curious>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our biocontrols group with HMIS, they stay on top of all of our tumbleweed collections. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I figured that might have been fun. Yeah, this is actually the time of year where they do control burns because uh, you'll see them on the fences. I mean, six, eight feet tall, completely <laughs> nice the fences. And they'll yeah. go through them. Okay. Right. Are tumbleweeds uh, historically dangerous and do they all cause wrecks? Yeah. It, they cause wrecks to the point where people swarm out of the way and lose control. They also uh, carry big rocks. They yeah. also carry rocks. Great big rocks. Yeah. yeah, it depends on 
how they're uprooted and how they're transporting because they come out of the ground. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it's uh, overcorrection by vehicles, which causes them collisions, but also there is their you know, pokey authority and they have the root structure that comes out of them that can cause damage to the vehicle as well. Yeah. We had to lay start a couple times because you couldn't even get into the facilities. <laughs> I mean, they're as tall as the trailers. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like a three hour delay. It's still the work and there's still no work. Yeah, it's a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so, Brennan, um, when you get suggestions for safety improvement, like from inside your committee or from the HAB invite, advice, or you hear things like this slip lane for 10 or putting carpool van right here on the videos or passing lane. It sounds like your team can do some of those. So how do you sort through like the recommendations and who do they get diverted to? Do you guys take some on and does it go to engineering? Yeah, I mean, certainly as a committee, we uh, discuss and come to a consensus during it, but yes, we want to focus on this. And then we just, we make that recommendation to the responsible entity, whether it's our traffic engineers, whether it's, uh, you know, the contractor interface board, whether it's uh, just the Department of Energy, you know, somebody that's going to make that decision in that way. We show a unified front that they have not just HMIS, but our other, all our contractors are on board. We uh, deem this as a viable safety concern, and we'd like resolution to this issue. We push it up from there. And then, of course, the lower level items um, we push out to the Proper entity, if they're able to take care of it. Um, like updates to your signs or website? Signage, our traffic engineer, our uh, roads crews, uh, you know, things like that. We'll just, some of those things can just be taken care of and not have to go through the process. We have, we have representatives from those different organizations from HMS and transportation, roads crews, all those that partake in the meetings. So a lot of it, when it's discussed, they can go and be able to take action. So, yeah. Well, Rebecca, any thoughts on the presentation or the discussion here today? Um, thank you, guys. Oh, for this presentation. Maybe, um, yeah. We could repeat the, the traffic safety from safe phone number. Okay, that that's if anybody has a problem or whatever, we can call that number. Oh, the 376 safe. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, 509 376 safe or 736. So we should all remember that. Yeah. Uh, so the committee will will have some discussion okay. with the committee here, um, and about you know, possibly issuing another piece of advice. This advice is old, um, so uh, but your presentation has given us you know, a little bit of groundwork to, to work on that. And um, I have any questions? Uh, I'll get a hold of you. I may even actually show up to a meeting. Okay, you are welcome. I was off work for quite a while, so I wasn't even on site. So, a uh, quick question to go off of that. If this committee were to issue you advice, would that be routed to you, or would you like to be a recipient of that advice? Not typically, because he would be a contractor, but it would go to Stan Brandt, correct? Yeah. 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 Okay. And it makes sense. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah, they just that. Yeah, he'll usually have, he has, yeah, two DOE representatives that attend, and they usually get that information, I'm sure. Yeah, and then, yeah, or standard has a long. Right, here. Yeah. So it might be useful to take a look at that advice for you, Wayne. Sure. Yeah, because you guys are talking about Yeah. Yeah, that's Did also you guys talk about it? Also, we can do the response. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. that's. I have a copy. Oh, yeah, there is a deal we response to this as well. How they responded. Okay. And you can find that actually on uh, the Hanford.gov oh. uh, website if you go under the HAB. Okay. It could be the Health Safety Environmental Protection Committee. Okay. Or the list out the Just the, the traffic, yeah, traffic safety. Okay. And if and you ever have any problems finding, you know, just reach out. And okay. we'll, we'll make sure you get what you need. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. 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 Thank you.
Where would you like to turn next? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to start with um, maybe have just a short discussion about the presentation that we just had. Um, I, I personally think that maybe some new advice may be wanted. Um, I would just like to know how everyone else feels about that and um, if there's anybody who's willing to help work on the advice if that's what we decide to do. So go ahead, throw out your. So I, I, I do think that reminding them. Well, or updating that 2019 advice to today's advice, because I, I do strongly feel the slip line to, to 10 is something we should remind them that we're out about it in this. Well, and yeah, and to take a look at the DOE response, because the response responses may no longer be applicable. Right. Right. Well, and the there, fire station that's right. That, yeah. And there are also, uh, since this advice was, there's been a new engineering study. So I think that that's what she was saying. It was done in 2020. So if there was a new engineering study done, uh, it would be a request to, um, to actually so see that. So Lindsay, where would that be? The engineering study, would it, is it available to us? That I, I don't have the answer to. I can look into that and see. Can you? Um, I think that would be something that we would bring somebody in to have a refund. Well, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with the, the advice from 2019 or the study, but as I mentioned earlier, I think partly we're talking to the wrong people here, that, that maybe engineering would be a better fit for us because the advice goes to those guys anyway, and and that's where the money is requested, not the safety guys. Yeah, uh, so they were representing the Hanford satellite traffic. Safety, right, and, and, I, and I appreciate that, and yeah. they were very good at it, um, I think. But um, but there's more that needs to be done regarding traffic. Well, yeah, I think that there's more information that the committee is looking for as far as a response um, and the engineering study. So, and like he was saying, those are two separate people. So, yeah. I can reach out and see um, what's available to bring the committee, and then we can kind of go from there. I don't know if that is necessarily needed prior to advice development. Um, I'd leave that to Rebecca and Richard. I would like to see if there is an engineering study, I would like to. To look at that, I would too. Uh, I would like to see yeah. the study. And yeah. a briefing is always nice, but I'd like to read the study. Yeah, yeah, because uh, I mean, we may be saying things that, are, that they already know. Okay. You know, if we're developing some advice, they may already know that, or they, you know. So it'd be nice to to look at that. So just so we're not spinning our wheels. Absolutely. I imagine that's an AR. The administrative record? Eventually. If not, I'm sure that they will for it. Is that a good thing? Sure. We're not. Okay, we're not. I mean, having worked out here, I would accuse something going to the administrative record, that type of thing wouldn't. Okay. If it's an RPP report, then um, it should be online for us. If it's been approved for public yeah. relief. Yeah. 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 Usually they are. Yeah. No, yeah, I, 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 I learned stuff here. I thought yeah. it was a great presentation. Oh, no, I, I really had no awareness of that many animal strikes. Um, I knew there was a lot, but wow, 22 in a year. I mean, that's that's a tremendous amount. That one thing it says we got a healthy herd out there. <laughs> but, um, I, can, I can attest to an almost indirect uh, uh, animal strike because some damn fool stopped in the middle of 240 to look at the elk. Oh, I came over to the elk. What? Look at the I mean, pull over. But, um, you know, those, the, the, you know, 240 is not DOE's bailiwick and, and that's where you know, talk about pull-outs or something of that nature but that's where 
you know, I know of at least three deaths uh, in my time working out there. Uh, and, you know, I, I, can, I used to commute in from Benton City, and that, you know, the roundabout definitely is improving. I used to take my life in my hand almost every morning just to make the left turn. Uh, but, uh, like I said, the, the recent death going into, you know, leaving Richland before the roundabout, I think that's attributed to that back of both traffic that the roundabout causes. And DOT hasn't, I mean, if you go to the roundabout, you'll see the tire tracks over the roundabout where people say, what? And, and you know, head off into the ditch. So DOT has done a better job over the river and some of the roundabout they put in between rumble strips or something of that nature. But that's, you know, uh, you know that's not the hand for commuters. They know the roundabouts there now. It's the non commuters that are flying through, uh, not expecting it. Because I, I wasn't expecting it the first time I hit it. What? Oh, this is nice. It would have been nice to give me a little bit more warning. Uh, but no, I, I think you know if we get the traffic study to, to see what's in it topic wise, then we can determine if we need briefing of where is it going. Well, I, I do know in the readings that um, Jennifer Reynolds is very press, really pressing on all of the DOE sites, including the solar power and other construction things. And I also know that um, they are really considering some of those small modular reactors out at the Unit 4 Monument site. And um, I can remember when we were constructing Unit 4, we had 3,000 electricians <laughs> that were coming out there every day. And, and that's not counting the other craft. And, and uh, um, you know, with, with the potential for Energy Northwest gearing up to construct new facilities, whether they're solar, whether they're uh, nuclear, um, th that is also a huge impact on the highway. Right, and uh, I think a lot of the traffic is going to Route 10. I think, and, and Route 10 is, will be picking up a lot of it because of the changes in the aviation, you know, the 240s just getting worse with the inland port. Oh, <laughs> that's uh, uh, So, uh, you know, I see you know, the improvements. I'm not sure they're going to eventually be improvements because of the traffic they're going to draw, but uh, the improvements to, to 224 and Eason all the way out to Keene and Keene going over to, to uh, Twin Bridges. <clears throat> That's going to be the way to go. And we're going to be pulling in the traffic from Richland, pulling in the traffic from the other part of Richland all going through West Richland to Hanford. So uh, I'd like to I'd like it if they were not reacting to problems rather than trying to avoid them. Right, and that's what I'm getting at with the slip line. I think that would be that would take a lot of it for me to do it, but it's it, yeah, you know, when we looked at it in 2019, it just made common sense. Yeah. Get them away from that intersection. Yeah, well, there actually used to be a road right there where it is. And you can actually see it from overhead. You can see where it actually went. And so, um, so what is the consensus then, everybody? Uh, you think that if we, once we figure out if we can see this engineering study, uh, maybe throw some words together on some paper and uh, for some advice and send it out. Anybody willing to craft that, Richard? Sure. Sure. So can we get their names um, put down so that we can maybe just have like a maybe a little email trail or something? We add something. So Richard, Dan, Becky, Larry, Mia, Rob. Can we repeat that a little slower? <laughs> <laughs> the lineup. <laughs> that was all in. Okay, it's all here. So will it be the 
if the study's available, will be sent to the committee? I need to look to see if it's publicly available and then um, what or how DOE wants to present it back, but I will be in touch with, with the group. Okay. Should we ask Rose if she wants to also be included? Is she stumbling? Well, that was my question is that will it go out to the committee? Like Big if it's being not distributed, not right? So that everyone who's expressed interest in serves on the committee. Well, I think the big committee. Right. Yes. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah, the little committee will right, right. Right. We'll work on the drafting of the list words. That if it's available, the traffic safety study, the study would go out to the LIDS committee members and, and then and interested parties. So right, yes, 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 yes. And then focus yeah. work with the <clears throat> team. Yes. Right. Right. We also need to reference the 301 advice. Yeah, Rebecca, yes. I think uh, that and if there was a DOE response to yeah, that, there is. I think that's there critical to, to see both of those pieces. And I think I believe that we so we wrote the advice, we got the DOE's response to the advice. I'm not sure we actually put it in writing our response to DOE's advice, but I know that we were supposed to have a uh, meeting on that and then COVID. <laughs> right, I was going to say that the DOE response is dated December 2nd, 2019. COVID hit <laughs> the end of January 2020 yes. and yeah. then started. And so we never year. actually yeah. got the opportunity to sit down like we normally do when we get responses. We never got that opportunity to sit down and discuss the response to the advice. So that's something that could be addressed as well. So we would, yeah, we would use the, the response and this old advice to maybe craft some new, something uh, more up to date. Okay. I also like your idea, um, something that I never did think of, and maybe that's something, uh, if we all agree as we're doing the advice, of um, having an uh, EM-wide Traffic safety committee. I like that. Like, yeah, where they meet here, like lessons learned, and things like that. Yeah. I thought it was funny they said they were going to go look at Idaho, and I'm like, Idaho has buses. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I said I can see Savannah River. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Anything else on presentation or uh, path forward for advice? I just have one question. Do you anticipate that advice will come to May or September? Or that will be determined, I guess, on the process? Yeah, I think it will probably be determined um, whether or not we can get the engineering study. The engineering study. And I'm also going to try to uh, see if I can get something from the city of Richland as far as George Washington Way and Jadlin. How, what the timeline is for that? Yeah, I, okay. I probably can find that. Okay. All right. Well, and I know the process. Thank you for volunteering, <laughs> Richard. Richard is going to get all the information on the well, one-way streets. Well, I was not bringing the information from West Richland. You know, like okay. I'm saying, our our plan, Richland's going to have their plans out on their websites that that I pull together. What I what I want to suggest is. You know, that may be in the background, but my, my personal opinion on advice is if we keep it simple, even if we have to do two, two pieces of advice, I think the, the focus should be on updating that advice you know, that we, we previously did, highlighting the people who respond and, and that type of thing, and, and focus on that. But the engineering study comes in, so we have yeah, one. We can do it, but we should update with. Richland's plants and West Richland's plants, and that, that way it feels more of the community's feel. Yeah, I might reach out to the uh, Council of Governments yeah, yeah. and see what Michelle. Michelle. I mean, and I'm going to tag team on that. I've looked at, and I think Mia has to, I know Mia has, we've looked at advices from different <coughs> sites. Ours are long. Incredibly <laughs> detailed, which is not a bad thing, but they don't have to be. We can do a higher level advice that doesn't, it, it isn't a dissertation. I agree. 
It has a point of clarification for me. So is is this an IM team or is it a work group that is being created? Uh, just I'm I'm new into That's developing advice, so. So tell me what the difference is. Well, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'm your new facilitator, and this is the first time that, you know, I've seen advice being started from scratch. So what I've seen, like, with other IM teams is that there's a lead, like, with, with Jeff taking the lead on the fiscal year, cleanup priorities, and Tom with True. So are, is this creating an IM team here, and is there a lead? Help me with process. I need a vowel. Okay. So I guess we could call it issue manager team. Is that all right? Is that a good? Okay. And um, okay. I'll take the lead on it, unless somebody okay. else wants to, because I'm more than willing to give someone else the, the lead. Richard? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right, Richard. Thank you for volunteering. Well, the vice chair needs to do something. Well, I, I, yeah, I look at it as, 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 I mean, my reason for being on the board is representing the citizens of West Jersey. And, you know, I think percentage wise, more residents of West Virginia are cancer workers than any of the other cities. Well, P and L live originally, but well, yeah. I'm talking Hanford. Yeah. Hanford, not P and L. P and L is a whole different. Yes, yeah. I know. And and so you know, as as traffic, you know, we have tremendous traffic growth problems in West Virginia. And you know, it's an exasperated by two more. And so that's why I consider it important. Because you know, Rachel's problems is Rachel's problems. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was looking through the DOE's response to the advice, and they said, well, engineering study has been done, you know, and we've never followed up. You know, well, that study, we did follow up. We asked for a copy of it, and in the end, it was disclosed that there actually was a study. Yeah. So that one is non existent. So hopefully, we can see what this one is there. Well, I will close the loop as soon as I have an answer. Okay. All right. So we have a couple of other items that we need to discuss uh, under our main business. Uh, so the ESC, what we call it now? Yeah, ESC. <laughs> the ESC had a call. Uh, we had two calls. Two, yeah. The last one was yesterday uh, regarding committee leadership elections. Um, So we're supposed to be doing committee, committee, typically we would be doing committee leadership elections at this meeting. Um, there was quite a bit of talk about the alternates, whether or not they could serve uh, as a chair or vice chair. Uh, there's still some talk about that. Uh, so the ESC decided that they were going to leave it up to the committees to decide whether or not they wanted to have their elections at like this now or to postpone them until later uh, and finish out the, the terms of the uh, leadership. Um, so that's something that we can discuss. Then, I don't know, there may be more information. But one of the pieces we discussed was shifting the term dates, start and term dates for committee leadership to 1 October to 30 September, the 30 days of the And that way, if we shift the elections or at least the uh, the term start date for the chair and the vice chair as 1 October, then that we still have time to talk about the status of alternates for the agencies to talk about status of alternates and for at least two of the alternates that are in leadership, two of the three 
alternates that are in leadership positions right now, they're in packet. Their packet is in to have them made change to um, extend them and to change the primary. So that would help mitigate some of the concerns. Um, and ideally, and I'm I'm going to bring it up later um, at the May meeting to change ideally to change all of our um, leadership um, term start end dates to one October to line to be to sync up with the membership dates. I mean, when elect, electing people in January, February was great when there were no term limits. Um, but now we have this gap between January, February, and the end of October or the beginning of October when the membership periods start and end. So I'm trying to clean up some of the disconnects. So what about the cab chair? That's chair going to be discussed at the May meeting. That would be just exactly that's I had already planned to bring this to the May meeting before we had all this discussion on alternates for committees. Yes. Oh, just as a point of clarification at yesterday's ESC or actually last week that continued yesterday. Uh, the ESC was provided two options. One was to continue the discussion on alternates, which would ultimately delay the membership package submittal, or to submit the membership package. Um, and the expectation will continue to be that members and alternate members adhere to their appointment letter verbiage. So it was determined that the group wanted to submit the membership package um, for this term the expectation will continue to be that members and alternate members adhere to their appointment letters and the request was made to have the department of energy headquarters work with the local office epa and ecology on revising the verbiage in those alternate member appointment letters now with that being said i've sent forward that request and i don't it's still too soon to provide a response but i just wanted to let the group know that i did put that forward so there's about six pieces that were just wrapped up here. Let's take one step back. So for the past two years, elections would be like right now, and when would those terms of service have started? Like in right. the past couple? With basically right then. Right then. Kind of they, it would end and start with the next committee. The next committee meeting, meeting. I understand it. So, so before all of this, there would have been elections today, and the new, the new or continuing leaders would have taken those responsibilities forward at the next committee meeting. Yep. So the proposal is that um, the terms, instead of starting at the next meeting, start October 1st. And if the terms of service start on October 1st, so basically the people who are in your roles right now continue your responsibilities till October 1st. If, right? if we don't have elections. Well, just the oh, no. grace no, no, period. Just the not have, no, I, let me say this. Kelly gave us grace mm -hmm. until the next election process cycle. So we either have elections today and alternates cannot assume positions, or we shift the election to later in the okay. year. So that was not my understanding. That so was my, my understanding. So my understanding, my understanding was you could have elections today, but the terms of service do not start until October 1st. Correct. Right. Within so the grace period, so yeah. okay. the, the proposal is that the new member, the new leadership starts October 1st. There's two options for that. There can be elections today about who takes those roles over in October. There is um, some pros and cons with that. Or the vote could wait until September for who's going to take the reins over in October. So you can have the elections now, you can have the elections later, but either way, the terms start October 1st. And so is that right? right? Okay. And then the elections, if you choose not to hold them today, would actually be in August because September we have a full board meeting. Okay. What and we'll, we can go to the pros and cons. Go ahead. Um, I, I, if we take a look at our schedule, I think it's really important that whatever it is, the new leader needs to attend the leadership workshop yes. workshop in June. Yes. Okay. So. My suggestion would be is 
We use this month to nominate. Okay, we have a meeting again in April. We have elections in April for the new leadership, if that's possible. But they again would not take their position until what we they decided in, in October first. You know, that's okay with me. But if we we concentrate on uh, nominations now, and so and work at trying to get and build interest in the next month, then we come back in April, elect our new leader, and then both the old leader and the new leader can be at the leadership workshop and share information, advice, um, you know, camaraderie, whatever it is. I think that works for me. That that idea kind of. Shells. So Rob, that that is the reason to have the election sooner rather than later is that old and new leadership would be able yes. to participate in the June and I, and I brought that up. So um, exactly, Larry and Lindsay. So then, does this subcommittee have an issue with uh, alternates? Well, let's. Uh, uh, we can't proceed. On Right, so no, no, just one second. We'll go through the alternate, Lindsay. Um, I was going to say the April meeting placeholders are for committees that are bringing right. forward advice. So there's, if the group is bringing forward advice in September, they will next meet in June. So the, I believe June. This was like a bonus for the commit for bringing advice to the May meeting. So it was Correct. people to wrap up advice. April meetings were to wrap up draft advice so it can be brought to the cab in May. Correct. That's now, what we now, if there is advice in process and this committee needs a working session, let's take a look at that as well. Um, I think that's a great opportunity to right. have a working session, but there's no, I guess, expectation or anticipation on my behalf that we'll have briefings coming for April because right. we wanted to make sure that there was enough time allotted for the group to to do the work that they're here to do. So with that being said, I believe that Judy, you have brought forward the request for nominations for chair and vice chair for all of the subcommittees. And so I don't know if you've received any nominations or if anybody has self-nominated. So, so here, here was the proposal is that the, at the ESC meeting is that there would be elections pretty much either today or it would be after if, if people wanted to be able to have new leadership participate in the June leadership session, the elections would be today. And we would ask for nominations today. And we have the votes and an opportunity for people to express why uh, they're interested in serving. Now, but going back, so now going back to the question of alternates. I think I'll let Lindsay explain this because there are some there Susan mentioned that there are some alternates currently serving in leadership positions. They're looking at what the status of those people will be in October. So maybe so we'll speak to that. I don't know. It's not going to be in October. Uh, oh, are you talking about the individual? Yes, the individual. So folks will be kind of shifting around with the new membership package. However, um, the guidance that has been previously provided has not changed. The only folks who will be eligible to serve in a subcommittee leadership position or a board leadership position are official members of the board or primary members of the board. Alternate members are not eligible to serve. And so, for example, for Richard, um, what would Richard's eligibility be? Come October 1, Richard will be eligible to serve as a, um, well, he will be in the membership package, Richard is. A primary member. So, if the membership package goes through as um, as anticipated, Richard will then be a primary member effective October one. So, DOE has offered a, a grace element here, Absolutely. and so Tom, example, um, Tom Cecilia, he'll be a primary, and DOE oh, yeah. has said they'll be a primary as of October first, so they are eligible to nominate and be elected. So, Richard. Could be nominated and elected to a position here because in October 1st, when the terms start, it's anticipated that he'll be a primary. Did I say that right? Correct. Okay. Rebecca. Yeah. I, so you clarified it. Okay. I was, uh, 
Yeah, it's a little bit. But if someone else wants to be vice, <laughs> all right, we're doing one thing at a time. So that's the role. Um, so that explains who's eligible, who's not, how the alternates are fitting in. Alternates per se are not eligible for committee leadership positions, and some organizations have said, oh, okay, since that's changing, we're going to change who we want in which position. So here we go. And for today, there is an open, part of the reason the nominations didn't maybe go out like they did in the past is that this was being sorted out literally until yesterday. So today and on the phone, are there people who are interested in serving as chair or vice chair, people you want to nominate or that you are interested in serving? And we'll get the slate of nominees and we'll ask people to vote if um, people, you know, people are running unopposed, then yeah, we'll just assign those responsibilities. But if there's more than one candidate, we'll do a vote. Does the group want to host or to hold the election today? I guess is the first question that needs yes. to be asked. Yes. Uh, let's let's find out. Uh, Rob, Rob, I, I shouldn't vote. I'm not really a member of this. Party. Okay, um, Charles. I think it's better to do it today if possible. Okay, where are you? Today, you're yeah. not an official member, okay? Let's get Dan, are you a, you're a member of the group? Either way. Either way? It feels wrong. Yeah, uh, well, I will say yes with the caveat that um, he is still eligible then yeah. to, yeah. Yeah, to run. Okay. Good. Then and, yes. And yes. And because we don't meet that often, it's always, <laughs> if we have been built people, let's do it. Exactly. But, but again, this would be fourth position starting after the one. Right. And and the current leadership would extend your term until October first. I see Rose. Unmute yourself and go ahead, Rose. Rose wants to be leadership. Did did you want me to talk? Yeah, go ahead. You're in queue. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um uh, I just wanted to say that um I I do not I'm um, I would be more than willing to to um, volunteer for some of these positions other than the fact that I um, am currently doing two possession two positions with Yakima Nation which is um, taking up an enormous amount of my time and and so because I'm currently also serving as the tribal historic preservation officer for Yakima Nation as well as my day job. And I just wow. really felt the need to, yeah, yeah. And I just, I mean, I didn't want people to think that I'm not willing to be involved or anything like that. I really felt like I wanted to express that. And when I'm done with this, with this detail, obviously I'll miss this cycle here, but when I am done with the detail, I do plan on becoming more involved in some of these things, but I just don't have the time right now. And I just kind of wanted to share that with folks just to let folks know that I, I do take these committees and these meetings seriously and, and whatnot. I'm just being pulled in a couple different directions very strongly right now. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. And, and in the future, I will look forward to, you know, hopefully being able to take more of a role in some of these activities. Rose, and thank you because that responsibility as THPO is a huge responsibility. And thank you for your, your efforts on the tribe in that role. But I know how extended that is. Yeah, that's it's uh, it's it's been a strain, and I've definitely been putting in a, a lot of hours. But but like I say, I just I didn't want people to think that I'm not taking any of this seriously. I do, and I do want to participate. And when I'm able, I certainly will. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, do we want to open nominations, including self nominations for chair or for list? <coughs> I'll nominate Becky for chair. And second. <laughs> second. Becky, are you willing to serve? Uh, I am. Uh... <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are there others who would like to be nominated or self nominated? I want to give a history because Mike Rico was vice chair of this committee and he was just getting slammed by other work, much like Rose. And he came to me, and that's how I ended up being vice chair of this committee. 
it's it's you know, he's moved on to other <coughs> other things, uh, fighting cancer and animals yeah. right now. Yeah, I, yeah. I actually took over from Mike. I was the vice chair, and then when his wife passed away, I took over. So spent a number of years. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I will I will self nominate myself if I start I unless someone has I to wanted to second. I wanted to nominate Richard for vice chair. <laughs> uh, unless anybody else has a burning desire. Burning desires going once, <laughs> going twice. Okay, the proposal is that um, I will ask, are there any objections to Rebecca? Continuing to extend her term as chair to um, continue a new term beginning in October. Any objections to that? Are there any objections to Richard continuing his term as vice chair and taking on a new term October 1st? Any objections? Then I say pop the champagne, the election is over. Congratulations. It was a hard fought campaign. It was. I forgot to bring the buttons today. Are you exhausted now? <laughs> Stay up all night and make it on. I missed the fundraising part. All right. Uh, we also have, but the glamour and title that goes with oh, it, yeah. the distinguished <laughs> prestige. It's the prestige and the extra pay. Yeah. <laughs> Updates on action items. I think that um, there's been a lot going on, and so Rebecca, we still owe a survey for the H um, the. There's discussion of a H H H tour, open house, and things of that nature. We want to collect interest, see if that was your end. And so we still need to follow up on that after the briefing that they gave. Oh yeah, I thought we, I thought we asked for interest at the last board meeting, and but we can ask around the table again. Uh, this is for the Hanford Workforce um, Engagement Center. Yeah, they did offer to uh, allow committee members to just come and look at you know their facility. It's a small facility. It's not, you know, real big. But if committee members were interested in just seeing, you know, what kind of a uh, facility is available for the workforce, Hanford, uh, and previous uh, Hanford workforce and their families, uh, that has been offered. So we're just trying to see, if, you know, if there is any interest. And if if there is, um, you can email have, you know, and we could try and schedule a small group or if people wanted to go in individually and schedule some time, I think that they were open to that also. Maybe, maybe we can offer that after In May? Okay. And see if, you can, if there's an interest in, in and I'm not quite sure whether it's an activity or invite from them because it won't take any damages. Oh, right. So maybe it could be an event that we could, rather than you know, put a tour bus together. Or no, we wouldn't be there. Yeah. yeah. The office so, on the detail well, and eat the going. Yeah. And so, yeah. so that, that would be my suggestion is we just simply schedule a time and plan to go rather than something like a tour. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I, I will relate a little experience that I had after that presentation there with the engagement center folks. I mentioned to a couple of friends of mine that are ex Hanford employees that are suffering and that, and uh, they didn't know anything about it. Wow. And 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 I think that um, we really have to stress it because it's an important function. I mean, after what. The site's been active almost 70 years, and and and, and the whole town should know about it, really. Um, and so, uh, I, I really think that um, it was an important message. It's an important effort, and um, we need probably need to champion this, uh, or this committee probably should champion this from the standpoint of uh, worker health and safety, 
and, and especially exhort your health and safety. And, um, uh, you know, whatever we can do to support that, either call it out at the, one of our main meetings to remind folks in that, um, but that reminder should be there every single time because, like I said, the two folks that I talked to, they had no idea about it. And, and one is right now in the boat with um, Cadillac Hospital with the vapors issues. His lungs are messing up still. And, uh, um, you know, they don't, Cadillac doesn't even know about it for the people he talks to. And, uh, and so when I took that hand out to him and his wife and showed him, and um, I think that I'm pretty sure they have gone since and talked to them. But uh, you know, I think that engagement center is very important. And uh, I can't tell you how um, I feel for people that feel like they've been injured at the site somehow and need help. Um, so are they active employees? No. no. Okay. So what would make that's a separate piece of advice we come together of uh, reaching out to them to prepare information that I mean as a city we can put out the information right. to, to our citizens. Bridgeland would be the same, same right. as Pasco. Right. If we had a you know their their flyer has Right, right. You know, they put it on Facebook post, shared who we share <coughs> You know, what's so interesting is that one of the fellows is and, and, and so from that standpoint, I can reach out to that, you know, to them and ask them for it. Yeah. Maybe I, I was going to say one of the sad things I see is that this one gentleman is um, 78. Um, had worked on the site for many years. Um, the newspaper went away. You know, Tracy Harold is almost worthless. Um, he's not computer really literate, and or he's, you know, him and his wife they try to do things, but they're not. Um, and and so he's like shut off from this. And 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 whatever thing we can do to advertise this engagement center or whatever the engagement center can do, it'd be really helpful to both, especially, you know, some of the well, other I was thinking, and I don't know if this is right, but community outreach and engagement, I mean, there could be flyers put up at clinics or other things. There was that woman who's doing the study that came to one of the HAB meetings. So, well, I mean, I'm thinking, especially like retirees, they don't, we don't get any information. Right, right. <laughs> His social worker should have known this. You know, he's got a lady that comes to a place, helps him out with his tubes. Um, and uh, <laughs> well, there's there's an organization that that is of social workers. It's a community community coalition that distributes a lot of them. It's a funding right. mechanism, and possibly that's so. I I am being mindful of time, yeah, but, um, yeah, but I, it sounds like getting this information out is important, that getting it out to healthcare providers is important. I'm not sure what the next steps are, but it, you know, this is a community outreach effort. Um, I, so there should be next steps. I'm not sure what they are right now. Maybe, Looking, it's, maybe it's something for the communications group to try to look at. A little joint effort, maybe. Yeah. yeah. We'll bring it up with Kyle. Uh, request a topic for next committee meeting. So we've got a, a few things in the queue. I think uh, for me, looking at these final moments, is does the team want space on the 16th or 17th of April? The 16th, there's going to be an all like an all Hanford employee meeting uh -huh. at assembly, and so. Um, we're going to probably ask that that meeting placeholder date be shifted. Okay, um, because the Committee of the Whole meeting on the 18th is going to be rescheduled uh, because the Rev 9 is not ready yet. And you said the 16th is going to be booked uh, with the Hanford? Yes. Okay. So, so essentially the 17th and the 18th will be the placeholders. So Tom Cecilia would like um, space for the true IM team to work. Uh, on the 17th, 
but on the 17th or 18th, if the team wanted to get together, we're thinking it might be virtual as opposed to in person. Yeah. It's not the true IM team. It's a committee meeting to pass to look at the true advice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. So, but it will be. Thank you for clarifying that. That CARM will have a virtual committee meeting to discuss the true advice. Thank you. Um, does this group want to? Uh, you could set a, a date. You don't have to use these times, but we've kind of got the standing window on the calendar right now. And if you'd like to book it, fine. If you'd like to find another date, that's fine. Well, let me tell you, you know, I, I, I signed up to be part of that true advice. And the LIDS, the LIDS charter includes disposal. And that true advice has to do with disposal. What I would suggest is that lids also be queued up for that. Make sure the invite goes out. Invite, the joint uh, meeting. Yeah. And and card is coming up next, so we can definitely drop that in. Right. So, did you say that's a virtual meeting now? Yes. Oh. So the proposal is that the card meeting, that's the current proposal, is that it would be virtual. So is the card going to discussing the true advice today. Is that on your day? Uh, I don't believe it is for no. today. They were planning on working the draft advice and then bringing it to committee in April for coming to the full board in May. Now, with that being said, just because the CARM committee wants to have their April meeting virtually does not mean that the Lens committee has to right. meet virtually. So if the group decides that they want to meet in person, we'll meet in person. So. Um, again, that is if we have advice coming forward for May. So I think step one before we book a meeting date or to reserve one is to oh. to have the issue manager team get together, essentially maybe on a call, or I don't know if you want to draft the advice, and then we can kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, can you tell me whether we'll get that report uh, how soon? Well, I can't give you an answer right now because <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm here. So I'll reach out to see if one is available for public release. And say, by, by money, you can let me know whether it is, is or is not available. I mean, in theory, I, I can try. Now, with that well, being no, said, no, is or is not. Yes, but what I'm trying to communicate is. People sure. take vacations in our office. Right. Yes, we will ask a question today. Well, whether I'll have a response by Monday, I don't know. But well, I'll follow up with you one way or the other. Yes, that's I'll follow up with you one way or the other. Yep. So, Richard, this is the present, this is the CARM agenda for today. True is not on there, and I will, I, I think we'll. Let Tom know that. He's walking around out in the lobby right yeah, now. Yeah, I'll talk to Tom. Okay, right. fantastic. Okay. So we'll wait to hear about whether, if, and when yep. you'd like to do a meeting in person or virtually for discussing or both. Or both. Or both. Or both. Yeah. Well, with that, we're just a few minutes over. Um, any final words, Becky? Uh, so topics for the next committee. Did we get that? Well, that will happen in June, correct? And so. Correct. So I know that there were two items. Um, the 300 area fire station was one that you were still looking uh, at hearing information about, as well as the engineering study. So I think that providing a document without any context or without the SME that is, I guess, there to interpret the information, it, to me, does not feel like the best way to present that information. So I just, I really need to track it down, see how the group or how how that SME wants to bring the information, if it's publicly available to committee, and then I can touch base and then we can go from there. Okay. Um, also, I know I'm speaking fast because folks probably want to eat lunch before the next committee meeting. The Rev 9A of the site-wide permit, I'm going to kind of punt this a little bit to Ryan. Um, I know that this was August. Go for it, Ryan. Yeah, so we proposed to, to move the committee the whole to August because we're just uh, not at that level yet where we can provide a really in-depth briefing day. Uh, in, in April, and I know that uh, Annette just spoke to the ad at the most recent board meeting to provide a little bit more information than we could. So the proposal is to move it to August, so we're still having that last committee of the whole before the end of the fiscal year. And I did submit that either way, with wherever we're at, 
and by that point, we should be able to come and present something. And if there's, there's still some unit groups that we're still closing down, then we probably won't go into as much detail on those, but we can still provide information on what we have, as well as uh, some other information that we'll work with having to present that you guys want to see. So uh, that's kind of how we'll view of that. I think we're looking at the fifth or eighth. Fifth or eighth would the uh, April 18th would shift to August 5th or 8th for the Road 9 Committee of the Whole. And also the June committee meeting includes um, draft work plans that will feed into the leadership workshop. So that'll be part of your agenda. Okay. Does anybody know quickly, does anybody know when the uh, site-wide emergency drill is supposed to take place? It's they May sixteenth, I think, or seventeenth. I think it's the Thursday of that week, whatever that day is. Okay. I think. This is the sixteenth. Sixteenth is Thursday. Okay. Yeah, okay. So I I'm sorry, I made 15 blocked in my brain. Okay. <laughs> so that's something that we could feed into because it's all, also emergency preparedness. Okay. Mm -hmm. The lessons learned and stuff yeah. like that from a little debrief of it. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Anything else, you guys? Thank you guys all for coming. Thank <laughs> Thanks you. for continuing to serve. Uh, Lindsay, been meeting the journey. Thank you. I'll see everyone back in.